Hey everyone, this is Judy with Altium's On Track Podcast. We are glad to have you back again. Podcast continues to grow and we thank you for listening. And I know that you are tuning in because I have amazing guests like I have today. So I would like to introduce you to my guests, but before I do, I would like you to invite me, invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with you and share a lot of information relative to PCB design and engineering. And also on Twitter, I'm at All Team Judy, and All Team is on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So we like to have conversations with you, not just monologues. So please connect. Uh, and make sure you subscribe to our podcast, too, so we can keep making these. Um, today, we are with uh, a couple great people that are involved in U.S. manufacturing of printed circuit boards. I'd like to introduce you to Mahir Shah, who is Director of Special Projects at Royal Circuits. Mahir actually was an EE and has lots of experience, hands-on experience, you know, doing, being in the trenches and doing design work. His father, right? It's your dad that owns Royal Circuits, Mahir? And so right. yeah, his, Millen, yeah, Millen. his dad somehow sucked him into the manufacturing industry. So we're glad to have him there, actually. We need more young blood. And also we have John Lass, who is the VP of Engineering. He's also one of the original founders of Royal Circuit. So gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for joining today. Thanks for having us, Judy. This is great. So Mihir, I'm going to start with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and then give us a little blurb on Royal Circuits. Sure. So as, as you kind of alluded to, I, I'm an electrical engineer. I started my career at Tesla Motors where I was in EE working on a lot of the coolest things with Model X and Model S back in the early beta days of that vehicle. Just got a crazy hands-on experience learning how to design your own boards, hand solder everything, just do things quick and get a design approach to rapid prototyping, which was great. And then I went to Taser, now known as Axon, where we worked on consumer devices that are, I mean, literally the Taser Taser device. So I was more on the power electronic side of, of the Taser weapon and some things on the body camera. So a really, really great experience, albeit limited, but really great in the short time that I was a full-time design engineer. And then, you know, somehow, some way, my, my dad convinced me to <laughs> join the manufacturing Yay, side of things. Yay, dad. And kind of and kind of, you know, one of, the, one of the roles is always like, look, you were buying boards and designing them for a while. Now come here on the other side and try to make it as easy, clean, and simple as possible for people to order them. Now that you've seen oftentimes what a pain it is or all the mistakes that you kind of made or things that delayed the time, cost, et cetera, kind of helped that on the manufacturing side. Um, and, and now, you know, Royal Circuits, just to give a brief overview of who we are and kind of our main value proposition, we're a big U.S. manufacturer of purely quick-turn prototype printed circuit boards. The whole idea is one to three-day turns in the Bay Area, same-day turns and weekend turns, totally acceptable, and all owned and operated by us all here in the United States. So we have two factories, one right here in Hollister, where I'm right now, right in the Bay Area, and then we have a factory down in Los Angeles that's purely flex and rigid flex, so we really focus on that technology down there. So we've been doing this for over 20 years. So we do everything from simple two-layer boards all the way to 30-layer HDI, high-density you know, high interconnect PCBs, fab and assembly, no minimum order quantity. So really, really focus on the low volume, super quick turn with an incredible focus on, on customer service and making sure that you know people get their boards when they need them and at the price that they want them at right here. Wow. Um, John, can you tell us a little bit about your background in the industry and um, and your history at Royal and what you do there? Sure. Uh, so my background has been engineering now for about 30 years. Um, I started out in the CAMCAD industry um, and was involved in uh, the very early days of uh, photo plotting when we used to build uh, boards with film instead of... Uh, you know, actual direct imaging as we're doing today. Mm -hmm. um, my dad and I founded the company 20 years ago uh, oh. here in Hollister. Um, and we, like Mahira pointed out, um, it's always been about quick turn, um, one to three day 
you know, prototypes, you know, all the way from two to 30 layers, um, and, you know, very uh, exotic type of materials and boards. So we've been around for, for 20 years servicing uh, our customers, and we still have some of the same customers 20 years later. So it's been uh, That's a, been good a good report run. card. That's an excellent yeah. report card. That's how we looked at it, too. Yeah. Well, my favorite stat about the company, just to interject, is that we really do have a 1% turnover in 20 years. I mean, I, I really encourage you to find another company in the United States that has such a low employee turnover. Everywhere I'm looking, John is a testament to that. Mm -hmm. People don't leave. We just keep growing here and in L.A. and in some of the other kind of businesses that we run. Same deal. Just, I, you know, employees I, first, customers first. Okay, so I'm going to become a board industry geek for a moment, but I want to point out something about that that may or may not be obvious to our audience, but something that I've noted. When you do work with a board house that has low turnover, your quality remains consistent because there aren't people coming in and muddying the waters all the time or on a learning curve or trying to insert something. And so totally. your processes stay a lot tighter and cleaner. And it, that may be something obvious, but it's just something that I observed over the year working for multiple board shops and assembly shops. It was a statistic before I chose to represent one of those places is what is your turnover? because I knew that would create a lot of chaos, not only for me, but for my customers because of um, the fluctuation. You know, customers, right, designers will say to me, God, I was doing business with XYZ company and all of a sudden they were great for eight years and all of a sudden they lost the recipe. And I go, uh-uh, they have had employees change. I know exactly what happened. Yeah. So I, yeah. we've all seen it. Yeah. Maybe an obvious point, but something I thought worth pointing out to our listeners. No, so, we appreciate that, uh, that, that, that point. And I will also say that uh, our production manager has been here for 18 of the 20 years. So, again, it, it does make a difference. It does make a huge difference. And, John, your tenure there and being, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. That's, again, a great report on you guys. So this morning, what I thought we'd talk about is... Um, stack up and impedance but from a manufacturing you know uh what yeah. you guys can teach designers and engineers that are laying out boards how you can help them sort of avoid some pitfalls um relative to stack up and impedance from a manufacturing standpoint so um john maybe i'll start out with you uh, or maybe you both want to kind of ping pong this one is sure. uh, for the uninitiated let's just talk about what kind of implications there are specific to stack ups sure um, well let's first start out with uh, materials um, I mean that's where you start <laughs> and there's a lot of do we have of enough time <laughs> like, <laughs> we well, could do a whole reason. thing on materials maybe we need to do that because you just yeah. said you had a lot of exotic materials. I'm like, oh, they're one of those. Okay, so, yeah. all right, let's talk well, about materials, sorry. No, I'm just starting out with just, again, just a very basic, um, our, our main uh, is, is FR4, um, high temperature FR4 materials. Mm -hmm. But we do get into a lot of Rogers materials for the RF type uh, designs, you know, a lot of hybrids combinations, um, a little bit of Teflon, so just, there's different variances, you know, on what you can use. Um, but getting diving into stack ups, um, you know, what what a lot of people don't think about is on the from the impedance standpoint is what are we doing with the uh, the outer layers as far as uh, the copper weights and the plating. And mm -hmm. I'm touching on that real quick because um, when you start out with you know a half ounce copper foil and then you plate up another additional ounce, sometimes when they're doing the modeling in the software. They're putting in half ounce and they model it and they get a certain number. But in reality, when you manufacture it, you're, you're plating on the surface. So a lot of times I'll get, you know, from design engineers, well, my, my model shows that it should be, you know, uh, 50 ohms and you guys are coming out of 55 ohms. And it's like, well, you're not taking in consideration all the plating on the surface. Exactly. Um, and that makes a big difference. And so we get a lot of that where there's a lot of model software out there on the Internet people can get, you know, go to. Um, we use a, a software called Archeo. 
Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, a very, oh, what's the right word, very um, deep system as far as it actually takes into consideration all the dielectric constants of the materials you're using in your stack up. For example, uh, different cores are built with different um, prepregs, and so they have different dielectric constants. Mm -hmm. Some of the uh, modeling software on the internet gives you a, you know, one setting, so you can put in, you know, 4.1 or 4.2 for your DK value. But in reality, depending on how the material is built, you have different DK values that can range all the way from maybe 3.8 to 4.2 on a certain, um, you know, uh, material like three, I sold a 370HR, for example. Mm -hmm. So when you're creating the stack up, uh, we have, you know, all of that in there. We have all the prepregs, the, the laminates that are being used, even the LPI and all the dielectric constants. So when we're modeling that impedance, it becomes very, very accurate compared to what, uh, you know, the models are on, on the internet. So we kind of get so a lot of that. I wanted you to pause there right there. You said LPI, so that's uh, liquid photo imageable solder mask. So d do you do you typically put the solder mask in when you're doing your models? Absolutely you do uh, because you get, you get a completely different reading. Um, there's a lot of designs where there's no solder mask on some RF traces. Mm -hmm. You get a completely different reading than if you put solder mask on. So absolutely that's a big, uh, big critical part. Another example, I'm glad you brought that up because um, again, they go out and model it on the internet. They're not putting the solder mask. They're not putting the copper plating, as I mentioned. They get a completely different value. Um, and then when we come to model it, you know, we're going back and telling them uh, we need to change their stack that they may have defined on their fab drawing because it doesn't meet the impedance requirements. Yep. Um, and, and also you do get a lot of designers that understand that, and they'll put notes on the fab drawing saying the manufacturer can adjust the dielectric you know, spacing or the trace widths within, you know, plus or minus 10% to obtain that value. So that's... Yeah, that's and like you point. said, I think that's a good point. What you said is, say, in the case of Isola or any laminate, they might put a data sheet that it's, what, 3.8? But it's not exactly 3.8. It can vary m minorly in a minor way, right, from lot to lot. Is that correct? Uh, not so much lot to lot as it is from... Uh, Material to material, so they, you know, if you they build all the way from three core to forty-seven core, you know, they're using one hundred six and ten eighties, and these are all prepreg styles that I'm mentioning, and each one has a different dielectric constant. So if you get a combination of them, you end up with a different value. Okay. Um, and that, that again, depending on you know how your stack up is generated. Um, one discussion we here and I had earlier today um, is about designers that specify in their fab drawing a stack up they want you to follow. And they can send it to board house X, Y, and Z. But if the if for example, uh, let's say they have a four layer and they want to specify they want eight mil dielectric spacing between one and two and four and three. Well, we may use a different series of prepregs to obtain that than another fab house. Mm. And again, DK values, different impedance readings. Um, so all that comes into play. Yeah, I mean, and that, that's a trade off. That's a, that's a consideration the design engineer has to make. In terms of how they're doing the prototyping, what the outlook is for them, and the turn times, and the cost, and you know, there's other factors outside the actual design and performance of the circuit itself. Because if you do it and you have it once, then you say this is my design. So at least you will have more consistency amongst different manufacturers. Because you see, I need these right. materials. I need to stack up. I did it. Do it. But you'll have consistency in the final product. But you more, I mean, most certainly will not have consistency in the turn times. The available materials that different guys have, especially when you start getting into more of the exotics and the and the high frequency stuff, so that could start playing into effect. And people charge different amounts for it based on the lead time, what they have in stock, what they want to charge, etc. So that gets complicated. But at least it'll be more close to a, a, a similar design on revision to revision, versus if you say, "Look, I'm just going to let the manufacturer do it and tailor it towards what I can get quickest and at best cost," that'll still give me my main factors and whether they are, you know, controlled impedance mm -hmm. or actual stack up height or whatever and let them do that. So that's kind of the, those are the two different ways that people can kind of go about designing them or going, you know, who designs them. And my, also another, my impression, another... John, before you go on is, sure. is that a lot of designers do kind of hand off that stack off to their manufacturers. Do you think that's true? Yeah, you know, yes, we, we get it kind of both ways. Um, um, in some cases, 
you know, we just get you know a stack up, for example, that says they want it to be 062 plus or minus 10 percent. They give you the layers that have the impedance requirements, and then we go and generate the stack up and you know and, and manufacture the board. Um, to me, that's probably the more straightforward way because you're guaranteed to get what you want. Um, sometimes they're specific about what they want. They they call out the dielectric spacings, um, you know, all, the core materials, everything, and now you have to build that stack up, then plug in their numbers, then model it, and then it usually doesn't come out the way they thought it was going to. Hmm. And again, we touched on the reasons why. So you, you kind of get a little bit of both. But what I was uh, going to start saying is that we also offer a, a service, a stack up service that you can come to us at pre-design, you know, you've got your board all laid out, you're ready to do your routing, and you can come to us and say, hey, I have a, you know, a six layer, an eight layer design, um, this is the material that we want to use, um, and you, you can tell us a little bit about your design, which layers are the plane layers, which ones are the signals, so we know what the reference to. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, 90 ohm diffs and 100 ohm diffs, and then we can go ahead and model that stack up at that time, we can come back and tell you what size traces to use for the single ended, the trace and space for the differential pairs, um, the copper weights, everything, and we can come back and give you that that complete stack up. So now that's using our materials, our DK values, you know, our st stack up software, and then when you go to route your design, if you use those numbers, then when we get back your design and your stack up, the project's done. There's, it's which it's, I think is a really up. great model because then you're doing kind of this. Um you know, this partnership, the, the mm -hmm. designer's telling you where they're trying to get, you're, tr you're actually informing them from a manufacturing standpoint, best practices, and I love that whenever that happens. It, I wish it happened more. <laughs> yeah, um, well, and again, and that's, we, we have a full-time engineer that does that all day long. Um, well, that's I'm great. Sorry, that's that's uh, free of charge, um, again, right at the, at the beginning stage. Um, to me, that's the smoothest way to do it. Um, yeah, and then you have a stack up. You can actually send in with your data package, and you'll be guaranteed to get you know what you want. That's awesome! What a great service! I love that. Um, you've talked a little bit about it. Um, is there anything you sort of want to add? Uh, the distribution of copper I get, I I used to um, specialize in RF and microwave boards, and that issue you talked about where they model it without the plating ending up on the outer layers, right? Yeah. The inner layers, it yes. doesn't matter, but the outer layers, you have to do multiple plating cycles, and then yeah. it's like completely outside of the range of what they simulated, and they're like, I don't know why. And without a fundamental understanding of the manufacturing process, it's easy to see you know, yeah. how that could get missed. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Um, I'm going to ask you guys three or three, four, five tips and tricks to give um, people who are listening um, some takeaways. But before I do, is there anything else you wanted to add relative to uh, stack up in regards to manufacturing or distribution of copper? May yes. Maybe just a brief. Oh, John, do you want to go? Well, no, I was just going to touch on, uh, you were talking, we were talking about outer layers and now you have inner layers. Um, on inner layers, a lot of times you, if they want to use heavier copper, uh -huh. um, I like, like to point out that that's great on plain layers because when you have heavier copper, your Z axis is higher. And now when you go to put the pre prey in, you have to have enough resin to fill in there. And mm -hmm. if you don't have enough resin, then it can cause delamination or, you know, other manufacturing, uh, issues. So again, to point out, I, we get a lot of that too. We get a lot where they want uh, two ounce copper on the inner layers and they'll mix their traces and planes together and they'll be putting formal traces on two ounces of copper. And yeah. That, that doesn't work. That doesn't work at all. Yeah. So you, then have and then you have a trace that looks like this, right? Like yeah. they're, or you, this, or they're not this anymore. They're, cause that's a hard, if, yeah, it's not a good idea. So, just to keep into consideration uh, from a copper distribution standpoint, mm -hmm. that when you're dealing with inner layers, you have to nest pre preg in between them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that definitely makes a difference. So, you know, if you're dealing with half ounce copper, no problem. You can pretty much do whatever you want. Uh -huh. um, once you're getting above one ounce, um, then it starts starts changing the ballgame. So, you know, from a copper distribution standpoint, um, you know, just take that into consideration. Um, when you have. I'm going back to impedance, but when you have impedance on the outer layers and you're referencing to a, a plane layer underneath, 
try to leave it all solid plane without mixing it with signals. That makes a big difference because now you have a nice, you know, consistent, even, uh, solid dielectric spacing between the two. Okay. So that's a definite plus. Okay. Um, if you're doing like a six layer, for example, where you have power and ground on layer two and five, and then three and four are signal layers, um, you have to use a lot more prepreg to nest in between there. So again, try to put most of your dielectric spacing between those two areas because you're going to need, you know, more of it to to nest the prepreg. So that's a little bit about uh, you okay know, copper distribution. All right. All right, guys. So let's talk about there. let's talk about some real practical takeaways right now for um, designers and engineers who design boards that are listening today. You know, from a manufacturing standpoint, I'm sure that you see some of the same um, oversights being made on a consistent basis. Can you give us like three to five sort of tips and tricks, things that designers should look out for when, you know, best designed for manufacturing practices that you guys see? Mahir, why don't you kick off? Sure. Well, mine has a bit of a tie-in more on the design side because that is more of my background, Uh huh. especially as of right now. But there's really two main design areas when it comes to stack ups and, and manufacturability. It's the whole RF analog side and then this digital, high-speed digital side. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of characterized by two very different but very heavy driving factors. Mm -hmm. On the RF analog side, you generally find your designs more um, influenced by the necessity for a low dielectric constant, low signal loss, um, Mm -hmm. you know, low leakage, and then generally these have a lower layer count. So you really need a low and uniform dielectric constant and all these other things. So your choice of exotic material is going to be far more important, but you don't necessarily need to work. That's going to be more of an important, bigger part of your cost and a factor in your in your design decision. It's just more important to the design. Whereas with a lot more high-speed digital stuff, these are usually way higher layer count. And they have all these other things like buried and blind vias, really, really tight traces, and just all these you know crazy ICs that have like 100 pins, these BGAs. That needs all sorts of fan out, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so your cost on that was going to be way more driven towards the actual manufacturing time and the complexity. And a lot of people, it sounds obvious, and probably on this podcast it is, but I mean, you'd be surprised even as you're designing stuff, people really don't fully understand that buried and blind vias, while they're so easy to throw in on in Altium and just say, hey, this is great, everything routes out perfectly, it does add a lot of cost and time. It sure does. And it very to manufacture, but it's seriously going to impact your design when you have to do more of that. And so that's gonna be far more important than generally your choice of material. But obviously as layer count increases, that cost is gonna be driven up too. So mm-hmm. things like that are good to kind of keep into consideration on the differences in the designs and things that engineers are looking at when they're designing them and how that plays out usually in cost and lead time for yeah. manufacturing. It's a lot of trade-offs, aren't there? Yes, that's right. Um, what would you say, John? Well. Uh, let's touch on unbalanced stackups for a second because we get a lot of that. Pretzels? Um, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So uh, again, I mean, one of the, the the things you need to take in consideration is you want to have a symmetrical stackup. Um, a lot of times, especially if they're doing hybrids, they'll they'll put like a you know a thick ten core Rogers on the top and then you know something thin on the bottom. And again, you want to you want to have a balanced stackup, otherwise you're going to end up with a warped board. Mm-hmm. Um, so that to me is a very a very key thing is to keep it symmetrical. Um, we'll get those stack ups. You know we'll have to go back and tell them. Listen, there's a possible of you know a chance of warpage. You know and try to explain to them. You know it needs to be symmetrical. So that's something to take into consideration. You know from the get go. Um, another one um, that we get a lot of, and I think I touched base on it a little bit, is take into consideration the copper weights you call out and the trace and space that you're routing, because it makes a big difference. So. You know, if you're going to be doing a three mil trace with a three mil space, we have to start with quarter ounce copper, and then on the outer layers we have to plate on the surface. If it's on the inner layers, you know, you can do small trace and space on half ounce copper. Um, but once you start getting to, you know, two ounce copper and above, you need to be at around six and seven mil trace and space. Um, and that's, you know, we get a lot of that where we have to go back and tell them, listen, your design has four and four. You're calling out for, you know, one ounce copper, two ounce copper. It's not possible. Um, so we're going to have to go ahead now and you know reduce the copper weight 
Or even worse, if they have to stick with a heavier copper, they have to go redesign their board and lose time. Explain so. that. It may be obvious, but explain why that's impossible. I've run up against this a whole yeah. bunch of times, but explain because it may be, not be as obvious as it is to you and me, John. Why can't you take two ounces of copper and do a four ounce of uh, four mil trace or a three mil trace? Sure. What happens? Well, there's two scenarios. One is when you give us a, tra a design that's four mil trace with a four mil space between trace and trace and trace and pad, um, in order to finish after etching that trace, we have to do what's called an etch factor. So now we have to increase that trace X amount, might be one, two, or three mils, depending on the copper weight, because again, um, heavier copper is a higher Z axis. So when you go to etch, you have a further distance to etch down to the, to the base of the copper to mm -hmm. get down to the laminate. Mm -hmm. So you start losing the feature size as you etch the copper down. So we have to increase that feature size. So if it's a four mil trace, and it's two ounce copper, we might have to increase that to a six or seven mil trace. But if your air gap is four mils, now we're reducing that air gap down to two or three mils, which is not manufacturable. Right. So that's where you become in, you know, coming to the problem. Um, okay. And again, you also have a peel strength. I mean, if you have a three or four mil trace on two ounce copper, I mean, the, the chances of it uh, actually peeling off the laminate is much higher because you have a, a certain peel strength. So again, you're not gonna have a small trace on a heavy copper feature. For, right. for various reasons. Right. And, and maybe even in more layman's terms, because this is what helped me understand it when I was doing, because you, you really don't learn this stuff if you're, when you're studying electrical engineering. Or maybe I didn't pay attention. No, I, I no, it. you don't learn it. You don't learn well, it. You're right. But, I mean, right. simplest example, the thing is people, maybe we could even put this up on the video. I don't know if you can add that. We'll, I'll add a link so okay. you can see a picture. Okay. But if you look at traces from, from the side view, they're not straight up and down, right? Never. They're at an Never. angle. The reason they kind of look like they're little trapezoids mm -hmm. is because the top of the trace, right, is, is under the duress of the etch of, of the actual chemistry a lot longer than the bottom. So as it etches down, the top is getting whittled away more than it is at the bottom. So you tend to end an etch like this. If your traces are really close together, you don't have that space in the middle. It looks like you have all the space in the world at the top. But when you get towards the bottom of that, of that Z axis, they're actually touching. So you can short out traces. Mm. I mean, that, that's like the simplest example without getting too deep into everything. Can you undercut but, too in that scenario? Or am I thinking of it backwards? Because. Yeah, uh, undercutting is, is the term you kind of get on the outer layers. With, um, when you have the dry film, you can kind of get an undercut. Mm. Um, but for the most part, it, it comes to, it comes to um, geometry. I mean, you, you have, you know, a very tight trace in space and you know, first of all, you have limitations on your air gap, and even if you could increase the trace, you know, uh, big enough, you're going to end up like Mahir pointed out with a very small trace on top and a larger trace on the bottom. Yep, yep. that makes sense. So, yeah, a lot of mechanical and electrical kind of issues. And as yeah, I had so a, simple. I have a friend in the industry who was in the board industry for 40 years, and he used to say, you know, it looks good on paper, but he said physics trumps theory right like theoretically it should work right but he goes but physics wins out every time so um here any more kind of practical design for manufacturing tips that you can think of or john either one of you i think we kind of if people take at least a few tidbits from what they heard today yeah yeah there'll be an immediate roi on on, on their time listening to this to the success and speed of their design good well, I'm excited to announce that um, Mahir and the Royal team will be joining us at All Team Live yes. as our sponsor. They Super just excited. let me know that today, so I'm very excited. So oh. I'm sure you guys will bring some sample boards or some video For and sure. some great assets that they can look at. They can talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, learn some more yes. tips and trips face-to-face just gather information, which is sort of the magic of Altium Live. Our goal is to just put the design community in a room with the supply chain, with people that are very knowledgeable, which are veterans in the industry, and just let them rub shoulders and, uh, you know, start creating new solutions or just collaborating for successful designs and take some of the pain out of it for all of us. So we're delighted to have you guys in San Diego. 
October. Yeah, I, don't need, I really don't need an excuse to come down to San Diego. Right? We I know. So. I know. And it's on Coronado Bay. So um, we're staying oh, at the Lowe's Coronado Bay Hotel. So there's like water yeah. on three sides of this hotel. It's, yeah. And it's on October, place. which is like October in San Diego is like heaven. It's like 73 degrees on the water, you know, so... You, you already know, sold us. Maybe right. We'll and so it's it. like if you if you're not come to learn some design stuff, <laughs> at least tell your boss you are and get a nice trip to San Diego. Just kidding. Yeah. So anyways, we're glad to have you and I'm glad um to to get to know you guys a little bit more. I know of Royal, but I've never gotten to know you until this last week. And so it's been a delight to get to know you both and yeah. learn from you and thanks for sharing your your DFN wisdom with our listeners and we look forward to engaging with you more at All Team Live. <clears throat> we'll be sure to share many links. Um, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think I have eight links to share um, from Royal and you can dig more into their what they do, who they are and get to know them a little bit better as I have this week. So I'm sure you'll enjoy that. So Mahir, John, thank you again so much for joining today. Thanks for joining on our yes. podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, well, until next time, um, please subscribe, join, engage with us at Altium. We always enjoy learning from you and learning about what you would like to learn about. Um, or only making guesses unless you tell us specific topics you would like to learn about. So keep the comments coming. We look forward to engaging with you next time on the On Track podcast. Until then, remember to always stay on track.